the respiratory system. Okay, stop right now before you go any further. Do you know what the respiratory system does? What is the main purpose of the respiratory system? For every organ system in the body, you should always know right away, what is this system for? What does it do? What's its purpose, all right? What is the respiratory system for? If you said breathe or if you said air, that's not good enough. What is the respiratory system for? It gets oxygen in, it gets carbon dioxide out. That's the kind of answer you need to have, all right? So let's talk about the term respiration. Three different meanings, really, although they're all closely connected. Ventilation of the lungs, breathing. We talk about ventilating the lungs, all right? Breathing in, breathing out. That's ventilation of the lungs. Exchange of gases between blood tissues and air. So oxygen comes from the outside air through our lungs. It gets into our blood. Carbon dioxide leaves our blood, enters our lungs, and then is exhaled into the outside air. And then finally, cellular respiration. Remember, oxidative phosphorylation, the electron transport chain. It's what you've known about. It's what I told you in this class. You have to know every day, all semester long. Oxygen and glucose make ATP with the three byproducts of heat, water, and CO2. <clears throat> All three intimately related, cellular respiration requires oxygen as input, produces CO2 as waste. C6H12O6, that's glucose, plus six O2s, oxygen, makes CO2 plus water, plus ATP plus heat. Notice that's also how you get your body temperature. It's from making ATP. Ventilation takes in O2 and expels CO2. We call that expiration and inspiration. All right? Now, inspiration and expiration have other meanings in our language. Here, we just mean either breathe in, that's inspiration, breathe out, expiration. doesn't mean that you're dead or that you're you know, being motivated by supernatural powers. Um, we can go without food for weeks, without water for days. How long can you go without O2? Try right now. Hold your breath. See how long that'll work. Yeah. We can go minutes without oxygen. Oxygen is the most important thing that we have to stay alive. That's why in nursing school they talk about the ABCs. Airway, breathing, and circulation. Airway comes first. You have to make sure they have a way to get air in. Breathing comes next. And in fact, I've had students who went through nursing school who said that their nursing instructor said, really, it's airway, airway, airway. If people can't breathe, they're not going to live. When you come upon someone who is obviously in some sort of distress, the first thing you have to make sure is that they have a patent airway, that they can get air into their body, and then that they are breathing. And if not, you're going to have to breathe for them. So, what kinds of things does respiratory system do in addition to getting oxygen in and CO2 out? Well, it filters the air, all right? There's a lot of gunk in the air. That's why you have things like nose hairs. Aren't those wonderful nose hairs? Yeah, that's part of it. That's what's going on. And all the mucus-associated lymphatic tissue we've talked about, Balt and Galt, the Malt brothers. So, we filter that air and try to, in, in, an, in an attempt to get the bad stuff out. Also um, provides for gas exchange, of course, oxygen in, CO2 out. Helps regulate blood pH. The respiratory system is one of the two systems in your body that regulates your pH. The other is the urinary system. So your acid-base balance. The respiratory system is crucial for regulating acid-base balance. In fact, we'll see, we'll talk about respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. So the respiratory system can cause the problem or the respiratory system can attempt to correct the problem if you have some sort of metabolic problem. So olfaction, your sense of smell, all right? That's part of what we do. We have the olfactory epithelium right there at the top of your nostrils. Um, smell is a survival sense. Somebody leaves the gas and the stove on, you need to know about that, all right? Oftentimes, too, like spoiled food smells different. I mean, going back for many millennia, smell. If you smell smoke, you know there's fire. Um, olfaction is a survival sense. 
produces sounds and resonance for vocalization like I'm doing right now. Our vocal cords work because air is being passed through them. And that's how we communicate with other humans. That's obviously a pretty big deal. You know, lots of animals, dogs, communicate by barking. So making sounds is an important form of communication and um, it's important for all of us. And your respiratory system is what does that by moving air past the vocal cords. It's also a way of getting rid of water and heat. So you may know dogs don't have sweat glands. The only way they can cool down is by panting. That's why you see dogs when they're, when they're hot, all right? And um, also water, you lose water every time you breathe out. That's one of the reasons we have to drink. We'll talk about that more when we hit the digestive system, but you're constantly losing water when you breathe out. And in terms of filtering air, I should say that um, the respiratory system also warms the air. Your lungs don't like really cold air. They want warm air. And the filtering you know, in the nose is what does that. That's why you shouldn't be a mouth breather. Breathe through your nose. That helps to warm the air before it goes down into your lungs. And there over on the left-hand side, we see some olfaction. That's an interesting little chain of events there. And we see those orangutans also with their olfaction. Then we see vocalization in the lower right. So important functions of the respiratory system. If I were to ask you on an exam, name three important functions of the respiratory system, I would expect you to be able to do that. <clears throat> Let's look at some basic anatomy. So the upper respiratory tract, and you also have the lower respiratory tract. So this is going to be important because when we talk about infections, we talk about URIs, upper respiratory infections, or LRIs, lower respiratory infections. So breaking down the respiratory tract, the nasal cavity, also called your nasopharynx, the paranasal sinuses, you learned about those in Bio 201. Remember the ethmoid sinus, the sphenoid sinus, the maxillary sinus, right, and also the frontal sinus. The pharynx, which means your throat. Um, pharynx is a very broad term. We're going to see that there are three parts to the pharynx. Um, parts that you normally don't think of as being your throat technically are your throat. The larynx is your voice box. That's how I'm making noise right now. So that's the upper respiratory tract. And then the lower respiratory tract is the trachea. That's your windpipe. The bronchi, those are the big tubes going out to your lungs. Bronchioles are the smaller tubes. So the bronchi branch into smaller tubes called bronchioles. Same thing we saw with the cardiovascular system, the arteries branch into arterioles, bronchi, singular bronchus, plural bronchi or bronchi, people say it both ways, branch into bronchioles. And then at the very bottom you have the alveolar ducts, the alveolar sacs, and the alveoli or the alveoli, people say it both ways. That's where you actually exchange the gas, all right? That's where the oxygen actually gets into your blood and the CO2 gets out of your blood. And then notice on the bottom middle, there's a clever solution if you've got a, a cold, all right? And the far bottom right, you see, would that be a URI or an LRI? That would be an LRI. That's a lower respiratory infection. That's an infection of the lung tissue itself. So here you see the breakdown. Um, URI, upper respiratory tract, um, nasal cavity, pharynx, and the larynx. And then the lower respiratory tract, the trachea, the primary bronchi, and the lungs, okay? And so, for example, cold. Cold is an upper respiratory infection. Flu affects upper, upper respiratory just like cold does, but flu also gets down into the lungs. So flu is also a lower respiratory infection. That's the same thing as coronavirus. That gets down into your lungs. And there you see on the lower right, there's pneumonia. And that's what happens when people die from COVID-19. Their lungs start getting filled with all kinds of gunk those are the alveoli, the little sacs. And once those get covered with crud, you can't do gas exchange. And that's how people die from COVID. They essentially suffocate. They can't get oxygen into their blood anymore. Okay, so the upper respiratory tract. All right, the nose. I think you all got an idea there. The nasal cavity. All right, so nasal cavity right there has different parts. You can see in the illustration on the upper left. The nasal conchi or nasal turbinates those are three little um, ridges. You can see there the three ridges. And then the nasal meatuses are the passages between the ridges. All right. So you have a superior, middle, and inferior concha. 
um, singular conca. It looks like concha. It's usually pronounced like a K. So conca, singular conca, plural conchi or conche. People say it both ways. And then the meatuses, again, superior, middle, and inferior. What's the purpose of those? Remember how I said that your, your nose basically filters the air for you? It also warms it? Well, that's what's going on. When you breathe in, the air has to swirl through those meatuses. That slows it down. Um, it comes into contact with mucus, all right, and therefore the mucus can try to catch any bad guys that are coming in, and that also warms it up. It's coming into contact with your body, and that's going to warm the air up. The nasal septum is the divider that separates your left nostril from your right nostril. And the external nares, some people say nares, those are your nose holes, all right? You got a left one and a right one. So the external nares. Then the internal nares. So the external nares are the two um, obvious that you can see nose holes. But then notice at the ends of the meatuses. See how each me meatus comes to an end? So the three openings at the end of the meatuses, it's really meati, um, are the internal um, nares or the... Um, <clears throat> There's another name for them. I can't remember what it is right now. So, but those are the um, those are the internal nares or nares. Then the hard palate. You learned about that in Bio 201. Um, you know when the bones. So you have the maxilla, and then behind the maxilla you have the palatine bone. All right. Those are the hard palate. When you stick your tongue up, you can feel the hard roof of your mouth. But if you go far enough back, it gets soft. That's where the bones end, and there's nothing but tissue. That's called the soft palate, okay? And the uvula is that little punching bag that hangs down at the end of the soft palate. That actually has a purpose. When you swallow, it folds back up and blocks entrance into your nasopharynx. That's so that the food you swallow doesn't back up and go the wrong way and come out through your nose. Although, didn't you know a kid, wasn't there a kid in elementary school that you knew who could, like, make milk come out his nose? You can kind of bypass that if you try. I have never have, because I thought that was really, oh my God. And then the nose. I think we all know what that is, all right? It's plain as the nose on your face. Then the paranasal sinuses. Again, you learned these in Bio 201, so this is all review. You've got the frontal sinus, the ethmoid sinus, the sphenoid sinus, and the maxillary sinus. When you get a sinus headache, remember, that's what's going on. The pressure, the air pressure inside the paranasal sinuses is not the same as the air pressure in the outside world. That can happen like you've got a cold or allergies, and basically mucus blocks off the ability of air to move back and forth between the paranasal sinuses and the outside air. When you get different pressures, that can build up and that can cause your headache. And then the pharynx um, is the throat, and the larynx is your voice box, okay? And here you go, solar bath apparatus helps cure diseases of the head. Um, notice, this is one point, this is why, you know, science, it's been wrong. Uh, notice what this is, this is an ultraviolet ray machine that's going to bathe your head in ultraviolet light. This is basically a cancer machine, is what we would call it now. They actually recommended this at one time. Put this over your head, turn on, turn on the ultraviolet light, you know, ruin your eyes, cause skin cancer. Yeah, sure, sounds great. Which is a disorder of the upper respiratory tract? Would that be pneumonia, cold, bronchitis, asthma, or emphysema? Should be easy, right? Yeah, cold. Cold is upper respiratory. All the others are lower respiratory. Pneumonia, bronchitis, asthma, emphysema, those are all down in your lungs. That's the lower respiratory tract. Okay, so the nasal cavity warms, humidifies, filters incoming air. Nasal mucous membranes, remember, part of the first line of defense. You've got the malt brothers, all right? Mucus associated in lymphatic tissue. Mucus is a sticky trap for pathogens, and then there are lymphocytes waiting there to kill them. You also have what are called respiratory cilia. You learned about cilia in Bio 156, little hair-like structures. And what they do is they all point towards the exit. So, you know, have you seen in parking lots sometimes, like in those paved parking lots, um, they've got those spikes coming out of the ground that you can drive them over them one way, but if you try to go the wrong way, you'll puncture your tires. Well, that's the way the respiratory cilia are. They all point outward. So that if anything gets caught in there, any kind of debris gets stuck in the respiratory cilia, 
the movement of the cilia are always going to force things towards the exit. They're going to make things move back out of your body. So very clever, a very clever device to try to keep things from getting stuck inside. Then olfactory epithelium. Epithelium, remember, is the outermost uh, tissue, the outer layer, and that's up there at the top of your nostrils, and that's where your sense of smell is, okay? That's where you have the bipolar neurons that create cranial nerve number one, right? They have, they have their dendrites right there in the mucus, and the odorants come directly in contact. Remember, cranial nerve number one is the only nerve that makes direct contact with the outside of your body, and that happens in the olfactory epithelium. That's where smell happens. Resonance for speech, so the paranasal sinuses. You know how everybody's voice sounds different? Some people have, you know, what we call a nasal kind of voice. Other people have a high pitch. You know, other people are very low pitched. You know, some of that is your vocal cords, but some of that is just the way that it resonates. For example, you know, a clarinet has a different sound than a bassoon, than a saxophone, and so on. Um, some of that, again, has to do with the reed and stuff. But some of that also has to do with just the shape of the instrument and what are called the harmonic overtones of that instrument. So the fact that people's sinuses are slightly different is what gives each of our voices a unique character. You can recognize someone's voice, can't you? We all have a distinct sound to our voice. That's because of our paranasal sinuses, in part anyway. The nasal conking meatus is increased surface area of the internal nose. And again, that's so the air has to swirl through so that you filter it and warm it before it goes any further. The nasal septum divides the left and the right nostrils. You have left and right nostrils so that if one gets clogged up, the other one can still stay open. All right, Kind of like why an F-15 has two engines. If one fails, the other one will get you home. And then the internal and external nares. Again, so this uh, shows it very well, this diagram in the lower right. The external nares um, says anterior nares, singular nares, plural nares. And then you see, um, yeah, there's the koana. That's the word I was forgetting. Koani is the plural. So um, those are the openings at the um, posterior of the meatuses. And then notice the human blockhead. Um, they used to be like a carnival thing. Take a big 16-inch nail. I mean, 16-penny <laughs> nail, not 16 inches. And stick it all the way into your nose. People go, oh my God, you're going to penetrate your brain. No, see what you're doing is you're going right along that inferior nasal meatus. See? You could get a nail to go right through there. You could make an entire big-ass nail appear to disappear inside of your head. I don't recommend that. I would think that the nail would cut um, the passages and you would start a nosebleed. But uh, I guess people who did that in the carnivals got used to it. They probably dulled the point of the nail and so on. But this happens a lot, actually, with little kids. They stick stuff in their nose. And... Um, then they can't get it out, and then mom freaks out, or dad freaks out, take them to the doctor, and all the doctor does is get some forceps, and you just got to reach in there and pull it out. That's what it comes down to. So I always kept a pair of forceps at home when my kids were small. I wasn't going to the damn doctor and pay them to get it out. You know, my kid was stupid enough to stick something in their nose. It's like, yeah, you're going to pay the price now. Hold still while I yank that son bitch out. And there you see the cilia. Notice they're all pointed in the same direction. That's so that if you inhale anything, cilia will work it back out towards the exit. Okay, isn't that cool? All right, these are just some terms. All right, there's, there's no uh, connecting concept here except that these are basic terms of the respiratory system, and I expect you to know them. All right, it's just one of the things we have to do. This is an anatomy and physiology class. We have to learn the names of things, okay? So we talk about the conducting division. That's the passageways that serve only for airflow. So think about your, your trachea, your windpipe. Do you actually get any oxygen into your body through your windpipe? No, the oxygen has to get all the way down to the bottom of your lungs. So your trachea would be an example of part of the conducting division, all right? All it's doing is allowing air to travel in and out. It's, we're not actually getting oxygen out of that air. Whereas the respiratory division is the alveoli, and basically that's it. Down at the very bottom of your lungs, you have what's called the respiratory membrane, and that's where oxygen actually comes into your body and CO2 actually gets out. So the difference between the conducting division, respiratory division, uh, it's just a matter of um, whether you actually use, it's getting gases in and out or whether it's just to conduct air to the place where we do get the gases in and out. 
The paranasal sinuses, again, we talked about these. You know these from Bio 201, all right? Um, drain into the nasal cavity. Um, so do secretions from lacrimal glands, by the way. That's where you get, you know, you get a cold, you get that j junk going down the back of your throat, you know, you're going like, oh, God, that's gross. Um, those are from your paranasal sinuses. You're just getting that drip down the back of your throat, all right? Rhinitis. So the root word rhine, rhino, means nose. Like there you see in the middle, you see a rhinoceros. Rhino means nose, ceros means horn. So the rhinoceros, the rhinoceros, is a creature that has a nose horn. So itis, remember, means inflammation. So what's rhinitis? Inflammation of the nose and the surrounding tissues. Okay, it's just a general... Rhinitis can be kind of a general term for a cold, all right? You've just got irritation, inflammation of your nasal passages, all right? Inflammation of the nasal mucosa, which line your entire nasal cavity. Epistaxis is the fancy name for a nosebleed. You should know that. And then rhinoplasty. So plasty, plastic surgery, rhinoplasty, nose. And there you see somebody that's basically getting a nose job. There you see um, a girl on the left who has um, a little bump in her nose, but she gets some rhinoplasty, and then it's now straight. I had a girl in my class one year who had rhinoplasty, and she let me take a picture of her. She had it. Like, uh, she was in my 201 and 202, and it was in between the two that she got the rhinoplasty. So she let me take a picture before and then a picture after. I've got them somewhere. I don't know.